seconds. My device doesn't suggest my mic is muted. Uh, can you hear me all right uh, in the studio? Please uh, send me a message and let me know if I'm being heard. Okay. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahduhu la sharika la. Wa ashadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. Which means in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. I bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship except one God, who the Muslims refer to as Allah, but who is known by many different names in many different cultures around the world. And I bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is his last divinely sent messenger and the seal of the prophethood, Amin. Brothers and sisters, uh, friends of uh, Salah Media, and uh, Al Haj Maurice Allah Khan and the Afia Foundation, we welcome you to another uh, another program in the series of consciousness raising programs uh, under the title. A conversation with El Haj Maurice Salakan. Today we have a very special guest, as all of our guests are special, but this one for me, because of his work and his uh, legacy of intellectual struggle and, you know, the way that he has been willing to come down on challenging issues that cause others to shy away. Uh, for me, he is a very, very special guest. Dr. Cornell West is a prominent and provocative democratic intellectual. He is professor of the practice of public philosophy at Harvard University and holds the title of Professor Emeritus at Princeton University. He is also taught at Union Theological Seminary, Yale, Harvard, and the University of Paris. Cornell West graduated magna cum laude from Harvard in three years and obtained his master's and PhD in philosophy at Princeton. He has written 20 books and has edited 13. He is best known for his classics, Race Matters, one of my favorites, and Democracy Matters, and for his memoir, Brother West, Living and Loving Out Loud. His most recent book, Black Prophetic Fire, offers an unflinching look at 19th and 20th century African-American leaders and their visionary legacies. Dr. West is a frequent guest on the Bill Maher Show, CNN, C-SPAN, and Democracy Now. He made his film debut in The Matrix and was the commentator with Ken Wilber on the official trilogy released in 2004. He also has appeared in over 25 documentaries and films, including Examine Life, Call and Response, Sidewalk, and Stand. He has produced three spoken word albums, including Never Forget, collaborating with Prince, Jill Scott, Andre 3000, Talib Kweli, KRS-One, and the late Gerald Levert. His spoken word interludes are featured on productions by Terence Blanchard, uh, The Cornell West Theory, Raheem Devon, and Bootsy Collins. My brother has really covered the gamut. In short, Cornell West has a passion to communicate to a vast variety of publics in order to keep alive the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., a legacy of telling the truth and bearing witness to love and justice. Without any further ado, I want to welcome my brother, Dr. Cornell West. My dear brother, I salute you. Salam media, my brother, peace be unto you. <laughs> I salute you, my brother. Indeed, indeed, you uh, what a force for good, what witness you have been bearing, and what wonderful relation you have to our dear brother, Iman Jamil Abdullah Amin. Yeah, 
Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much, my brother. And thank you for being here. I want to begin, in fact, with a... Um, uh, first of all, let me ask you, how, how are you and your family faring in this global pandemic that uh, has, has insisted on us changing the norm in our behavior? Yeah, no, I've been very blessed, my brother, and I pray God that you and your loved ones are doing well, but really uh, under a pandemic or under any ordinary context of struggle, which is always difficult, each day is a breakthrough. Each breath is a blessing. Yes, indeed. And you just try to fortify yourself, to be ready, to be equipped in order to bear witness. Yes, indeed. Brother, I want to thank you once again for responding to our humble request for your written perspective on the political imprisonment of Imam Jamil, the former H. Rap Brown. Uh, for our newly released book on him, The Imprisonment of Imam Jamil Abdullah Al Amin, Is It a Government Conspiracy? And we believe it is. I would like to begin this conversation with the opening paragraph from what you wrote. Um, the very first paragraph reads, quote, the black freedom struggle is the greatest tradition of spiritual fortitude and moral courage in the modern world. In the face of white supremacist hatred, capitalist greed, and American terror, for over 400 years, we have unleashed magnificent love warriors and lion-hearted fighters for black honor and human self-determination. Imam Jamil Abdullah Al Amin, formerly known as H. Rab Brown, belongs within the pantheon of the cloud of witnesses who sacrifice life and limb to keep alive the black freedom struggle. <laughs> I would like to uh, begin uh, by asking you to expound uh, for the benefit of those who haven't read the book, who haven't read your commentary, expound on, on that excerpt uh, for the viewing audience please well i was i was blessed that you reached out uh, uh, allowed me to say what i wanted to say about my dear brother of course i knew him as h rap brown uh, uh 50 years ago that was prior before he underwent this magnificent conversion uh, mm -hmm. to islam but uh, i begin with the notion that for 400 years uh, the American empire, but in many ways around the world, uh, even longer, black folk have been terrorized, traumatized, and stigmatized. And yet we have unleashed, we have produced some of the greatest freedom fighters in the face of terrorism, some of the greatest love warriors in the face of hatred, and some of the greatest healers in the face of trauma. And I was trying to situate my dear brother, H. Rap Brown, known now as Imam Jamil uh, Abdullah Al Hamin, as one of those great freedom fighters who had the courage to straighten his back up, coming from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Jim Crow, Gut Bucket, Louisiana, Baton Rouge, Dillard, Howard with his brother, connecting with SNCC following Stokely Carmichael, finding himself in the middle of the most intensified moment of the war against black people, which was 1967, the summer of 67. People will remember Newark, people will remember Detroit that was violent with the police violently coming at killing black people. And he's standing as a soldier with a profound love of black people and a hatred of white supremacy and a hatred of the terror and trauma and stigma coming at black people. And so he was one of the great voices and figures of that day. And of course, in a white supremacist civilization where black love is a crime, he will be criminalized. He has been criminalized. He has been not just unfairly incarcerated, he has been viciously targeted by the US government. We, we've got all the data from the FBI in 1967, we're after Ma, Elijah Muhammad, we're after H. Rat Brown, we're after Kwame Torres, Stokely Carmichael, we're after, a, a, after Brother Maxwell. 
uh, up so that we, 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 we realize that the black freedom struggle has always been an anti-terrorist struggle. It's been against terrorism coming at us. And we've had a variety of figures who surfaced with tremendous power, tremendous spiritual uh, uh, buoyancy, because this is what you get in, uh, in my dear brother, known as H. Rap Brown, and now Iman, uh, Iman uh, Jamil. Tremendous determination and strength. So even under solitary confinement, he's still going. Even under the gag rule, where people don't have access to him for interviews. I mean, people can interview serial killers. You can interview folk who have raped people. You can interview folk who have stolen billions of dollars, but you can't interview this particular love warrior and freedom fighter. Why? Because there's something about his spirit that becomes contagious. Mm. The brothers and sisters feel it in the prison. We, he felt it in Cambridge, Maryland when he spoke. That's why the US Congress had a bill targeting just H. Rap Brown called the H. Rap Brown Bill to hunt him down. And he, in fact, had little, nothing to do with what happened in Cambridge, Maryland. But of course, unfairly, just like Mumia Abu Jamal, just like Geronimo Pratt, and the other great, right now we got Asada Shakur. The Obama administration put a million dollars on her head. Yes. So much for neoliberal black politicians fundamentally concerned about black freedom struggle, you see. So that I was just blessed to be able to uh, to say you know say a few words though, brother. You allowed me to do that because we we just have to be honest and candid about those who loved us, mm -hmm. and we must never ask permission from anybody, especially white supremacist structures, especially white mainstream, to give us the right to define who we love and define how we understand our realities, and most importantly, to define what we say and what we do. And so that same freedom that you get in the eighth grade draft Brown, you can feel on John Coltrane playing the saxophone. <laughs> he ain't asking for permission for nobody <laughs> to find what's inside of his soul, or Sarah Vaughn, or Hugh Masekela, or, or Makiba, Mary Makiba, that freedom inside of them and we know, of course, it comes to a variety of different religious traditions. I'm a revolutionary Christian. My dear brother's revolutionary uh, Islam. You magnificently prophetic Islam. You see it. I mean, we uh, uh, Malcolm was, was was Muslim. I can't conceive of myself without Malcolm. I'm Jesus loving free black man. He's a law loving free black man, and he's Jesus loving too. In terms of Jesus was one of the great prophets in the rich history of, of Islam. But then you got Bell Hooks, our black sister, who's Buddhist. She's on the same love train. She's on the same freedom train. James Baldwin was agnostic. We can go on and on in this regard. So we, we, we embrace one another uh, mm -hmm. as human beings, as right. black freedom fighters, as fighters, as love warriors. And most importantly, and I think this is something we could talk about in terms of the, uh, the conversion and the transformation of Imam Jamil, that as he grew older, in that prison cell in Attica and underwent that profound transformation and conversion, that he gave the primacy of the moral and the spiritual as a revolutionary. Now, H. Rap Brown, as a younger brother, you see, I don't think he had that same kind of depth of spirituality hmm. because he had a fire, but the fire has to have something beneath it that's tied to a reality bigger than oneself. And my hunch is, you know him better than I, I my hunch is he came to that realization. Because when, 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 when the evil forces are coming at you, it's never a joke. And you got to be so fortified that in the end, any justice that's only justice soon degenerates into something less than justice. It's got to be rooted in a deep love that connects you to a God or some reality bigger than you. So when the injustice comes at you, you will forever be able to take it in, but not cave in. And he has never, ever caved in. Absolutely, brother. You know something? I <laughs> One of the questions I was going to put to you was, and you just touched upon it in a, in a very uh, uh, profound way. 
uh, it was going to be a question of, of how closely you followed the evolution of H. Rap Brown to Jamil Abdul Alameen. And, um, uh, you know, what your, your thoughts were on that evolution. Now, you just, you, you just uh, uh, shared some, some, some wonderful insights on, on, on your perception of that transition, that evolution that you went through. Were, were, let me ask you this. Were you present at that special event for Kwame Torre at Howard University before he passed away? No, no, I wasn't. I wish I Did had. Did you see the video? Did you see the video of it? No, I didn't. I heard about the magnificent uh, presentation of Imam Jamil mm -hmm. that blew people's minds. I got telephone calls from it. They said it was the most scholarly, sophisticated, refined reflection on black revolution, on morality, on spirituality, and most importantly, that his enactment of it in his very mode of presentation, mm -hmm. that there was a peace of mind, there was a grounding. He had deep spiritual anchors so that his spiritual fist and spiritual anchor were consistent with one another, but still fundamentally connected to a love for black people, a love for poor people, a love for oppressed people, and a love for everybody in the great tradition right. of his love. He's loving everybody. Right. But, the, uh, but I did not, I haven't had a chance to see it though. I'd love to see it, my brother. Yeah, it, it included an analytical critique of the movement that he was a very prominent part of. And one of the things that he said, uh, uh, Dr. West, that um, mm. uh, to this day, you know, it, it resonates with me. And when I, when I reflect on that speech, there was a part of that speech in which he, 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 he engaged in this very serious critique and in, 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 in noting that, you know, one of the drawbacks of the movement back then was that, you know, the behaviors of some of the revolutionaries right, were like right. the behaviors of the oppressor. And so, right. you know, as a result, yeah. you know, we were, uh, um, we, we were, we were interfering with the effectiveness of, 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 you know, what we were calling for because, because of the, the behavior wasn't what it should have been on the part mm. of some of the quote unquote Ooh. revolutionaries back then. No. I thought that was a very, telling point and, and like you said it did uh you know i i wasn't president i was in another part of the country but i saw the video of it later and then i've seen it again two or three other times since then uh the last time maybe three weeks ago and it was really interesting it was telling to see the way the audience you know responded to that message it was really really now is that on youtube though it's on YouTube. You can you can see oh, it. It's on I oh, I got check. I'm gonna check that out today. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna check right, that out today, um, brother. No, absolutely. No, but I think part of the uh, uh, the challenge always is is that I mean, one just as human beings, you know, we all have have proclivities towards sin. We all have proclivities toward narcissism and hedonism and egoism and so forth. But we're but you see, for the last fifty years or so, we've been living in the midst of an American empire undergoing such deep spiritual decay. Now it began with spiritual uh, decay, with white supremacy and mistreatment of indigenous people, stealing of their land and enslavement of precious Africans, and the subordination of even white working men with no property, couldn't vote, and the domestic violence and the the the, the confinement of women to just private spaces and not allowing them to enter public life and so forth. But there was a intense spiritual decay that started uh, uh, with the intense commodification of the culture. And so it undercut strong families, strong mosques, strong temples, strong churches, strong synagogues, strong civic associations, and everything became something for sale and everybody became somebody for sale. You get the whole the, the full-fledged commodification of a culture so that black people, even in our freedom struggles, will be affected by that spiritual decay. And so we'll look on each other as just objects to manipulate or women to engage in conquest over or whatever, you see. And I think that mm -hmm. that's something that is so very important in terms of us being vigilant 
spiritually as well as being vigilant yes. politically as well as yes, being indeed. vigilant morally and we have to have friends like like yourself and him who keep each other accountable we can't do it by ourselves mm -hmm. we can't just look in the mirror and be accountable to each other because we too often lie to ourselves as Dostoevsky tells us don't lie to yourself because you end up spreading mendacity across the board and it happens with leaders no matter what color and what happens with uh, uh with followers no matter what color agenda is but I, I i can't wait to see that though brother i can't wait to see that speaking of leaders former u.s ambassador to the u.n atlanta and atlanta mayor former atlanta mayor andrew young in january of this year publicly reiterated his belief in the innocence of Imam Jamil. Uh, in fact, and I say reiterated because I was present at the courthouse during the trial for the entire trial and was there when Andrew Young took the stand uh, during the sentencing phase. And uh, it, many believe that it was, you know, his influence, what he said uh, when he took the stand after Imam Jamil was found guilty that uh, and with the with the state prosecutor's office wanting the death penalty it was you know the influence and the words the perspective of andrew young that helped to keep him off of death row but he recently back in january he reiterated his belief in the innocence of imam jamil and called on that same district attorney's office to revisit the case um the late Congressman John Lewis, who also knew Imam Jamil personally from his days as H. Rap Brown, um, and represented, you know, Atlanta in the House, he never did. Um, why do you think that is? And, and do you know of any other black congressional leaders who have raised questions about Imam Jamil's case? That's a wonderful, wonderful uh, question, though, brother. I think. Coretta Scott King was strong as well. And that's and she's worth yes, mentioning. Yes, of course, she's in your yes, in your absolute. text too. She came yes, to very strong. So. Truth teller. Uh, uh, but and, and I salute Brother Andrew Young for telling the truth. And I'm thoroughly convinced that uh, that my brother is innocent. I'm thoroughly convinced that he is the victim of a vicious target of COINTEL Pro, of FBI, of the government all the way up to the government all the way up to to, to the president, that includes all of the administrations, Clinton, Bush, o Obama, across the board. You see. Uh, but no, I don't. I don't know what Brother Lewis. And Brother Lewis, of course, is a fascinating case. Uh, in some ways, he reminds me of, of the great and one and only Nelson Mandela. Both of them were courageous beyond description as young persons. Both of them were visionary sacrificial beyond language as they moved into politics they became neoliberal politicians mandela takes over south africa he's got to now work with white capital and make sure that the white population is feeling secure so he ends up delivering for them not just psychologically but he delivers economically because the Poverty is still there. You haven't dealt with the land question. You haven't dealt with wealth. You haven't dealt with assets of poor people. So you can end up with a black middle class and a black bourgeoisie in South Africa, but the black poor and the black working class are still excluded. Now, this is the great Nelson Mandela. I, I talked with him when I gave the Nelson Mandela lecture in 2006, what I call the Santa Clausification of Nelson Mandela in South Africa. The, the white folk want him to look like Santa Claus. So he's a, he got a smile all the time, got toys in his bag. He's not the revolutionary on fire that he was when he was in that jail so magnificently and courageously for over 20 some years. So he becomes a neoliberal politician, but it's hard to say this. I said it then, got in trouble, but that's all right. And he told me, he said, you know, you, 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 you pointing out some important points here. I said, I want to talk about a billionaire. I want to talk about Joe Slovo. I want to talk about Walter Sisulu and Albertina Sisulu. I want to talk about all of those freedom fighters, not Bill Clinton, not Michael Exeter, all these folk from America, neoliberal white folk from America that came in and tried to colonize the image of Nelson Mandela. Now, John Lewis in the US context, heroic, visionary, 
willing to die, just like A. Trap Brown, just like Stokely Carmichael, just like Diane Nash, just like Jim Lawson. We can go across the board, just like James Bevel. These are unbelievably courageous freedom fighters, black folk. When he becomes a politician, he becomes part of the establishment of the Democratic Party. He becomes a loyalist to Hillary Clinton, to Bill Clinton. He becomes a loyalist to Nancy Pelosi. And I love Brother John Lewis. I always love John Lewis. But I tell the truth about my brother, you see. I tell the truth about him. So, so the, the critique of Wall Street's not there. He's not criticizing Obama, dropping dropping the uh, drones in Yemen. See, I believe a, a child in Yemen has exactly the same value as a white child in New York City or a black child in Atlanta. So if you got a black president dropping drones in Yemen or in Somalia or Afghanistan, you got to raise your voice. John Lewis didn't do it. You see, so when it comes again to our dear brother, Imam Jamil, that's outside of the neoliberal zone. You see, you can't, you can't say a word if you're a neoliberal politician, even when you once were a great revolutionary figure. Same is true in 2008, you could have 550 precious Palestinian children killed in one month. And none of the black politicians, not even John Lewis, can say a mumbling word because he's in the back pocket of the neoliberal Jewish lobby. And people say, oh, that's anti-Semitic. No, that's anti-Semitic. We got some radical Jewish brothers and sisters telling the truth about Israeli occupation. Noam Chomsky, Stanley Arana, Witts, and others. We're talking about truth. We're not talking about Jewish identity, black identity, anything else. But we love Palestinians. And we will focus on their suffering. And if the Palestinians were doing that to Jewish brothers and sisters, we'd say the same thing for Jewish brothers and sisters. It's a moral and spiritual issue. So in that regard, my dear brother, John Lewis, and we've all you know, rightly celebrated uh, him. He's been colonized by neoliberal Democratic Party, and therefore he becomes their patriot more so than the black freedom fighter concerned with those friends for known called the wretched of the earth in every corner of the globe. That's how he spoke in his 20s. That's why they had to censor his speech in the March on Washington. And even our dear brother, Nelson Mandela, you know, by the time he retires, it's Bill Clinton and company who are giving him standing ovations. You say, wait, 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 wait. How, how did you become so close to these neoliberal imperialists in the White House? What happened to the wretched of the earth solidarity? And Mandela is a very complicated person, so he he got both going on at the same time. And and and, and I don't want this to be construed as a trashing of either one of those brothers. It is a principled attempt to understand their shifts from being revolutionary figures to becoming politicians and some of the real pitfalls of becoming a politician in moving in a neoliberal mode as opposed to a revolutionary mode. So that's a long answer to your question. But I think that's one of the reasons why my dear brother John Lewis was a uh, uh, what was in no way uh, uh, supported, but I, I introduced them here about four years ago. It was it was fascinating because I they had not planned it. They asked me to come up and say a word, and I gave him a big hug, and uh, and he whispered in my ear. He said, uh, "Don't be too harsh on me, brother. Don't be too harsh on me." And so when I got up, I gave a tribute to Willie Mae Lewis and Eddie Lewis, his mama and his daddy in Troy, Alabama, and gave him the love. I gave a tribute to the church that shaped him. I gave a tribute to First Baptist in, in Nashville that also shaped him with Lawson. And I said, now we have disagreements on Obama's drones, on Wall Street domination, on not hitting mass incarceration strong enough, on not talking about issues of class and not talking about empire. I said, but I love you, my brother, and you know that. And then we hugged again. So you can have that kind of brotherhood even as you as you disagree. But we have to tell each other the truth. You know, we have to tell each other the truth. So I think the very fact that we haven't had black folks step up and tell the truth about our brother H. Rap Brown, our brother Iman Jamil, it's it's it, it, it's you know, it's a sad thing. And, and all of us are culpable. All of us have to be accountable in terms of uh, 
of his plight and predicament in this regard? What are your thoughts, expanding this conversation a bit, on this unprecedented social justice place that our deeply disturbed nation is in right now? Is this, in your opinion, a moment or a movement? And, and what are some of the factors that produced this moment or movement in your view? Uh, it, uh, oh, and, and you can hear me all right, my brother? Yeah, okay. No, I think that uh, we've got a neo-fascist gangster in the White House who has made it clear that the raw reality of power at the top is driven by greed, corruption, and indifference to the vulnerable. Now, in many ways, that has always been the case, but not, it has never been as explicit and as raw under Donald Trump. Then you have a pandemic that exposes this in an undeniable manner. Then you have massive unemployment, economic collapse that affects large numbers of the citizens in the United States, not just the poor and working class. It affects middle classes. It affects upper middle classes. It even affects ruling class. So when you get all three of those together, my brother, it becomes very clear that those who have been talking about the issues of poverty, those who have been talking about the issues of militarism, those who have been not just external militarism, 800 military bases above the United States all around the world, Russia and China combined only have 30. The military budget of the United States, 720 billion more than the next 10 countries combined. That's what it is to be an empire and with your vast, vast amounts of your resources tied to military buildup. But then there's also the unbelievable wealth inequality. That's why Brother Bernie Sanders was so very important. That's why I supported him uh, in, in, in a strong way. To talk about 1% of the population having 41% of the wealth. To talk about the bottom 90% of the population in America have wealth equivalent to three individuals in America. That's a, a, that's a level of wealth inequality they hadn't had under the monarchs during the old days of, uh, of, of, of kings and queens. But then there's a spiritual issue that we were talking about, my brother, where people begin more and more just to give up and cave in. People more and more believe, in fact, the only way they can survive is to be well adjusted to injustice and mal adjusted to indifference. So even when you become successful, you turn your back on the vulnerable, you turn your back on poor and working people, and you become an isolated individual spectacle of success that everybody puts a spotlight on you rather than you actually using what you have to be of service to those who are suffering in my own Christian tradition and in, of course, the Islamic uh, tradition as well that embraces so much of, 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 the, of, of the Bible as well as the Quran, that uh, what you do to the least of these, you do unto me. What you do for the prisoners, what you do for the poor children, what you do for the oppressed, what you do for the persecuted. That means what you do for Roma in Europe, what do you do for the Dalit in Indian, what do you do for the poor and working class precious brothers and sisters in South Africa, even after apartheid. Apartheid is just a particular structure of domination. You got economic structures of domination. You got effects of white supremacy still operating. Don't end up with a leadership that is just well adapted to a status quo because they are doing so well individually in their little groups and families and the rest of the people are still suffering and you think lo and behold you've made a major breakthrough you got to keep track of the evils even when certain evils are overcome there's other ones that are operating this is what malcolm taught us this is what martin king taught us this is what fanny lou hamer taught us that's our legacy that's that's john lewis up until about 40 years old he made that shift he still had elements of it in his spirit, but he became part of an establishment of Democratic Party. That's Nelson Mandela all the way up until he becomes president. And then he looks 
at all of these corporate elites. He looks at international capitalists and he says, lo and behold, I've got to somehow sustain this country or the empires outside are going to pull the run from under it, but I'm going to have to produce policies in which poor people are not at the center. Working people are not at the center. And that's where the critique even of our precious Nelson Mandela needs to take place. And by the time you get to Brother Cyril and the others, it becomes even more telling. And that criticism needs to be made in a loving way in the name of suffering people in South Africa. I agree, my brother. I agree. Ooh, I, ooh, I it reminds go. me of a... Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it reminds me of a, a poem that I wrote years ago. Let me see if I can remember the words. What, what good is a revolution when the fruits of victory carry a strange duality? When the aspirations of the masses are shattered like glass against the wall of reality, what good is a revolution? What good is a revolution when dreams become nightmares? When the liberators become the oppressors and cries of celebration plunge into despair, what good is a revolution? What good is a revolution when my babies are hungry? They can't read or write. Their bellies are aching. They can't sleep at night. What good is a revolution? 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 What good is a revolution when in the aftermath only the names and faces have changed, but the oppression remains the same? You know. Oh, that's powerful, brother. That's um, powerful. No, we saying the same thing, but it raises the issue. Did a actual revolution really take place? Because you see, revolution is, is about the transfer of power, wealth, resources, and land to ordinary people. To those the great Sly Stone called everyday people. If you didn't have that, you had a little reform that took place. That was significant. You know, apartheid was evil. You got to break the back of apartheid. We broke the back of apartheid in the South, in the Black Freedom Movement, in the American Empire. But what happened after Jim Crow? Well, we got Jim Crow Jr. So what happens after apartheid? You get apartheid Jr. Because you didn't have an actual revolution. You had reform that took place and the powers that be wanted to give some concessions, but just enough concessions for them to preserve their power, their wealth, and their resources, you see. So that, I mean, and, and I, 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 I love the way you put it in your poetry, because you see the poetry is always deeper than the prose, brother. Just like the music is always deeper than the words, you see. You gotta speak to the heart and the spirit and the core uh, uh, of who people are. And that's what your, your poem crystallizes that and clarifies that in a way. And yet we just still have to keep fighting. You know, we still have to keep fighting. And the early Mandela would tell us to keep fighting. The early John Lewis would tell us to keep fighting, even sometimes against their later selves. What are your thoughts on the upcoming elections in November here in the U.S.? Well, see, I, I think that we have to first just tell the truth and recognize that, uh, I mean, I've been, I've been calling uh, Donald Trump a fascist for a long time. A lot of people think I'll go too far. Now, all of a sudden, he's talking about delaying the elections, not accepting the results of the elections. He's sending in these federal troops in cities with no names and arresting people without giving them any information. I mean, that's, that's fascism in, in an undeniable way. But fascism is the rule of big money, big military, scapegoat the most vulnerable. It could be Mexicans at the border. It could be Muslims with the Muslim ban. It could be black folk. It could be Colin Kaepernick, who's standing, who goes down on his knee in order to stand up for justice. All of those are scapegoats in order to divide the people so that they won't confront the most powerful. And so you got a fascist in the White House. And, and, and sadly, you know, the Democratic Party is just so decrepit that they end up producing a, uh, a mediocre, milquetoast, neoliberal centrist as the candidate to go against the neo-fascist. So we have a choice between a neoliberal disaster and a neo-fascist catastrophe. 
And that's the history of black people in America, right? Pharaoh on both sides of the bloody Red Sea. Now, I, 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 I quite deliberately view myself as part of an anti-fascist coalition to get Trump out, to get him out. And so I have argued that in those swing states, they should vote for Biden over Trump, but don't lie and say Biden is some kind of major force for good, some kind of salvation figure, some kind of uh, 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 progressive, because he isn't. He's the architect of the largest prison system in the modern world that targeted poor people, disproportionately chocolate people, black and brown. He supported the invasion and occupation of Iraq. Over um, half a million people have been killed. Each Iraqi life is precious. He brags about it, you see. So that you have to just tell the truth about him and then say, if this is the choice that we have to make as part of an anti-fascist coalition, we end up with this mediocre, milquetoast, neoliberal centrist who's been tied to the mass incarceration regime as architect, who has been tied to one of the major architects with Bush of one of the most ugly invasions and occupations we've seen in the world in the last in, in the last 30 years or so, you see. So we're caught between a rock and a hard place. Uh, but the truth telling must go on. And again, you see, our allegiance in the end is not to a mighty flag, but to an almighty God. You see, that the politics that we engage in cannot be the only terrain upon which we find ourselves. There's got to be a connection to a spiritual terrain that empowers you to intervene in that political terrain, but not sell your soul for a mess of pottage. And we've got a problem in the United States. Most of our black leaders have sold their souls for a mess of pottage. They can't wait to be highly visible. They can't wait to be celebrities. They can't wait to have grand status and other people look at them like they somebody. I like what Brother Bootsy said. We just did a song together. It came out a month ago, what he called stars. He says, stars have no names, they shine. How are you shining? And I come from a gut bucket black church tradition that says, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. So if you're gonna be a star, I wanna know the scope of your shine. I don't wanna know what clothes you're wearing. I don't want to know what your achievements are. I don't know, want to know what your educational level is. I want to know the quality of your love, the depth of your courage, and your willingness to sacrifice. That's what we have in Iman Jamil Abdullah al -Hameen. His life has been one of service in which he's been willing to give it all, empty himself, donate himself, sacrifice himself, deal with the vicious fascist face of the United States. He called it a Fourth Reich because that's what it was for black people. Now for white folk, it was something else. It, it was something else because it, 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 it was apartheid society. So he was telling the truth from his vantage point and was willing to give it out. That's very important. That's very important. And again, our great artists, our great poets and our great musicians have been willing to give it all when they do their thing. James Brown give his concert brother go three and a half hours and always within the concert. I'm an extension of you. You're an extension of me. I don't exist without you. Did anybody come here to hear a song that we didn't play? He didn't play soul power. He say, hit it, Bootsy. He's there to serve. He given everything. So when we leave the stage, we have given everything inside of us. That's what our leaders have to learn. They got to learn how to be cold trained like. They got to learn how to be like Teddy Pendergrass. They got to be learned. They got to learn how to be like Aretha. Give it all. That's what our dear brother Iman Jamil. He gave it all. Stokely did too. Well, I mean, he got, you know, name change. He gave it all. Mandela gave everything as a revolutionary. And then when he shifted into a politician, he was still giving much, but he couldn't translate the revolutionary fire into 
that neoliberal capitalist regime called post-apartheid South Africa. So predatory capitalism was still operating. It just became more colorful with a black bourgeoisie, with a black middle class. But those who ought to be at the center of our vision, the least of these, the precious wretched of the earth, the poor, the handicapped, the elderly, the children, the working people, that's, that's our movement. That's, that's what C.L.R. James, that's what Nkrumah, that's what Du Bois was talking about. We have to be true to the best of our movement. Marcus Garvey understood this as well in so many ways. I'm sorry to go on and on on this, but. Oh, no, that, that's quite all right, my brother. You know, speaking of the, the traditional black church and the role that the black church uh, has played in times past, in the in the spiritual and 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 uh you know the the, the material sustenance of our people that there's an excerpt from your, your your bio that reads in short cornell west has has a passion to communicate to a vast variety of publics in order to keep alive the legacy of martin luther king jr a legacy of telling the truth and bearing witness to love and justice and we've seen that we've seen that passion uh, in the in the last 45, 50 minutes of this interview. O on this note, can I get you to expound uh, a little on the differences between prosperity gospel and liberation theology? Mm. And which, in well, your we, opinion, is needed most at yeah. this time in our people's history, and why? Absolutely. Well, one, of course, we want to acknowledge the text of 1993, our dear brother Iman Jamil revolution of the word and uh, we we're very blessed to have one of his students there at harvard as the chaplain who's my very very dear brother who studied with him he's a magnificent brother who talks about this book in his classes and so forth it's a way of understanding the fact that god and allah are in solidarity with oppressed peoples that god and allah are in fundamental a, a, a source of empowerment when our mosques and our churches are at their best, when they refuse to accommodate to evil, refuse to accommodate the structures of domination, when they speak the message of deep love and justice and mercy and remembrance and remembrance, the memories, so that even in our prayers and in our rituals, we get fundamentally replenished by re-invoking the memories of those great ones who came before. Now, in the United States, when you get commodified culture, you get commodified religion, you get commodified Christianity. So that all of a sudden now, people talk less about the cross. The cross is about truth and love. And they talk about the flag. That's why when they put that flag on the coffin, of Reverend John Robert Lewis. He's an ordained Baptist minister. In the end, it looked as if they were trying to put the flag over the cross. That upset me, because he was a man of the cross, unarmed truth, unconditional love, embracing folk who are suffering and being willing to, to sacrifice. The flag is idolatrous. The flag must be under every cross. The flag must be under Allah. No matter how grand the nation state is, if that's your allegiance, it is idolatrous. No matter how much you like the flag, people got a right to like the flag, no doubt. But if you put that flag over Allah, something's wrong. That's, that, that's, that's idolatrous. You put that flag over God, that's idolatrous. You lose that. Well, we've got a lot of idolatry in our black churches. And so they've become very much business operations. We got mega churches, but not a lot of mega courage. We got mega churches, but not a lot of mega love. We got mega churches, but not a lot of mega fire for justice. That's why the prison ministries of our black churches, I've been blessed to teach in prison for 37 years. And it's, you don't see a whole lot of prison ministry these days in black churches. You see building funds. You see cars and other commodities for the preachers and so forth. But see, that, 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 that's the betrayal of the gospel. 
the betrayal of the gospel, you see. So that unfortunately, we just haven't had enough churches to hit it head on. And its relation to the Black Lives Matter movement is very important here because the Black Lives Matter movement, as you know, is, is led primarily by our precious sisters. You got a number of queer brothers and sisters, gay brothers and lesbian sisters and precious trans and so forth. And the black churches have, have really been unable to speak the gospel to a number of the women who come in consciousness and become womanists or feminists to really keep in track of the humanity of gay brothers and lesbian sisters and, and trans. And therefore they leave the churches and now they become leaders of a movement far removed from the church or at least most of the church, you always have some prophetic folk. You've always have some folk who just there no matter what, you know. And uh, uh, so that's been a major uh, break. And so we don't have the same strength of the black church now that we had in the 1960s. A commodified church can never be a source of struggle for freedom. It's a struggle for prosperity. It's a struggle for trying to fit into an unjust status quo. The final questions, in fact, there, there, there are two. I'm going to connect the two together. We have about, uh, what, uh, six or seven minutes left in, in, in the program. And uh, I'd like to, for you to, to address both of these together, if you could. Sure. The the description of your book reads in part, excuse me, uh, 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 yeah, of your book, uh, uh, Black Prophetic Fire, and I've got to get a copy of this, your, your, your most recent work. The description reads, uh, the, the book offers an unflinching look at 19th and 20th century African American leaders and their visionary legacies. My question to you is where does Reverend James Lawson fit in? Because of all the speeches delivered at John Lewis's funeral, I enjoyed his the most. Absolutely. I enjoyed Reverend Lawson's speech. I mean, that 93-year-old brother gave a fiery and very informative address. I've listened Absolutely. to it three times already. I'm going to listen to it again. I There's know what history you in it. And, 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 and also... Uh, in, in, uh, along with the response to that question of where does J Reverend James Lawson fit in, there is a renewed grassroots interest now in Imam Jamil. There's there's some activity taking place out here, brother, that um, is building up momentum for exerting pressure for a new trial. What advice, what words of encouragement would you give to the brothers and sisters, uh, most of them young, a few gray-haired elders like myself, um, uh, to to encourage to encourage that fire and to and and to bring others into it. Inshallah, Taala, God. Bless. Yeah, a, again, though, brother, wonderful question. But look at those two figures, Reverend Jim Lawson. His father's from Canada. His mother's from Jamaica. They met in Ohio. He goes to Nashville, is booted out of teaching, but who does he teach? John Lewis, C.T. Vivian, Diane Nash. They all become his students. He's older than Martin Luther King Jr., still going, as you say. I just talked with him twice in the last week and a half because we, 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 we talked with Mark Ridley Thomas on the phone. In fact, I had told him he ought, to, he ought to pray about not going because 92 years old in the pandemic, you know, that's, that's, that's a risk and we love him too much. He said, no, no, I promised John I'm going. I said, we, we praying. And I thank God he did the whole world could see him. He's still on fire. He gave the most magnificent eulogy because he told the truth on, from a global level. He kept love at the center of it, but he also had a radical analysis. Plantation capitalism was the word he used, the phrase he used. Remember that? The plantation capitalism tied to white supremacy, tied to the militarism around the world. world. He was against war. Now he is a principled nonviolence brother like Martin King, like Desmond Tutu. I have great respect for those brothers. I'm not. I believe in just war. See, I would have fought, I would have fought with the spirit of the nation in South Africa. They had a spirit of the nation in the United States. I'm going in in the name of Jesus. But I would have fought against Hitler. Did another gangster. Alliance with the Soviet Union. So I believe in just war. But I want to exhaust all nonviolent options. 
So in that sense, uh, uh, someone like H. Red Brown has the same love that Lawson has for the people, but he says freedom or death. Now, when he says it, they try to kill him and demonize him. When Patrick Henry says it, when George Washington says it, when Thomas Jefferson says freedom or death in the face of the British Empire, they become one of the greatest heroes of all of European and Western history. H. Red Brown saying exactly the same thing for black people. He becomes a, a criminal to them. So you see the hypocrisy of white supremacy, but you got to keep track of the love in H. Red Brown for him to say that. You see, all these people being treated this way for so long, and he and others going to stand up and say, we are willing to die. We are going to defend ourselves. That's what human beings do who love people. Somebody mess with your mama? What you going to do? You're going to defend her and yourself. That's what it is to be a human being, a man, a woman, and so forth. That's what you get in H. Red Brown in his particular form of it. That's what you get in Jim Lawson in his particular form of it. They're part of the same Black Freedom Movement. Lawson, nonviolent all the way down. H. Red Brown, I'm going to be nonviolent as long as you all are. And if you get ugly and funky, I'm going to get ugly and funky too. Same tradition. So you can imagine, we got a little glimpse of that element of our movement on television at the funeral of John Lewis because of Brother Jim Lawson. And as you know, you know he was the one who invited Brother Martin to uh, Memphis. And so that's a heavy weight on him because uh, Brother Martin was, was, was killed in Memphis. But he is, he, he is a magnificent human being. He is a still strong as ever. And uh, United Methodist minister, pastor of Holman Methodist Church. I, 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 I preached there. In fact, I preached there with uh, Alan Bozak about 25, 30 years ago in his church. But most importantly, right now, you are allowing these kinds of conversations. You are enacting in your own prophetic witness so much of what we're talking about. And I salute you, my brother. And let, and let us pray for each other because it's going to be through prayer, praxis, vision, courage, determination, laughter, love, and music that's going to get us through. Other, uh, what, just one last question. We oh, are sure. right at the three o'clock hour. Just one last oh, question. Uh, there is a um, a few years ago, maybe four or five years ago, we saw each other in Philadelphia. It was at a Mumia event. It was a large oh. event for Mumia. And uh, as we were leaving, I gave you a copy of a book, a book that was titled Dr. Afia Siddiqui, Other Voices. Did you ever get into that book? I mean, I know you get a lot of stuff handed to you, bro. Um, uh, I know a brother Sadiqi in Boston, but that's a no, different no. brother. Okay, no, no, this is Afia Sadiqi is a sister. She's a Muslim woman. Oh, it's a sister. Oh, yeah, Doctor Afia Sadiqi. I'm going to send you some information. Please, no, I, I, I need to be educated in this regard. So yeah. Cause how, uh, that was a little while ago, though, wasn't it? Oh yeah, that was about four or five years ago in Philly, in Philly at a yeah. at a big event. Uh, for Mumia, yeah, and I um, think I probably brought it home and put it, put it on a stack of things, man. And these things, right, up. right. I, I, understand. Oh, oh, man, man, I apologize. No, absolutely. well, let me let me just say this. I'm going to send you some more information because Imam Jamil, he's in his 20th year of political imprisonment. Dr. Athia Siddiqui, a graduate of MIT and Brandeis with honors. A sister from Pakistan, brother, came here when wow. she was 18 years old. She has been a political prisoner, and she's being held at FMC Carswell uh, in Texas. Uh, she's been in a political prisoner now for 17 years. Oh, and my God. To, to give you some perspective on the, 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 the significance of her case, Ramsey Clark said a few years ago, the case of Afia Siddiqui, is the worst case of individual injustice I've ever witnessed. That says a lot coming from that says a lot from him. He's seen a lot of them. He's seen a lot yeah. of them. 
So um, I'm going to send you some information. And she, and she, because, she's a Pakistani um, sister too. Huh? Yeah, she's a Pakistani sister, brother. Exceptional, brother. She came, she came here when she was 18. She did her freshman year at the University of Houston. She has a brother in Texas, in Houston, Texas. Um, mm -hmm. That's her only blood relation she has here. She and uh, uh, that year, that year that she spent that freshman year, she ended up getting a full scholarship to MIT. Wow. She went off to MIT. She graduated from there with honors and then went from there to uh, Brandeis uh, uh, the University where she got her PhD in cognitive neuroscience. My and uh, it, it's, it's a, it's brother, the case of Afia Siddiqui and Imam Jamil Abdullah al -Amin, these are two of the many cases that we're involved in. Yeah, that really weighs the heaviest on my heart. It weighs wow. heavy. So yeah, I, I'm gonna send you some No, but any, any help I can be, you let me know. Any okay. help I can be, you let me know. I just talked to some of the uh, brothers and sisters working for Julian Assange mm -hmm. uh, because yes. he's about to go under here and they, uh, and they, he's been targeted as well. You know what I mean? Just trying yeah. to just make transparent what actually is being said. Are they lies? What's actually being done? Are there yeah. crimes in the name of the U.S. government in various parts of the world? Right. And uh, all empires don't want to reveal what they're really saying and doing. That's right. And, you know, alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah to Allah, one of the, there, there are many lessons to Mumia Abu Jamal's case, his tribulations and the response to it. One of the most important lessons for me, yeah. my dear brother, is the power, the people's power, the power yes. of the people. I mean, to That's think true. that one of the most powerful lobbies in the United States, the FOP, you know, uh, responsible for a lot of the madness that we've seen in police Absolutely. departments around the nation, that they have been, you know, campaigning against this man for his execution for years and years and years, and people's power got him off of death row. I mean, it's, That's you know, so I true. often say to my Muslim brothers and sisters and to some of my other uh, 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 activists, my activist brothers and sisters in different parts of the country, if you want a, a good example of, uh, you know, what people's power can do and, and an example of, of what it, an organized campaign uh, can do, you know, it, it's, it's the MOVE organization and the folks connected That's with MOVE, so you go, Pam in Philadelphia. Africa, Ramona, Africa, the MOVE, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, brother. So, and, and, uh, and, and it's multiracial. You got a whole lot. Multiracial, that's right, brother. It has been that it's way a beautiful thing. for as long as I've been connected to it. It's been that way. It's been that way. That's it's, right. It's very powerful. I'm, you know, so anyway, brother, I want to thank you so much for being the brother that you are. The intellectual that you are, you know, in some of the most uh, 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 prominent and and academically pristine institutions in the country, and for you to have maintained your fire the way that you have, you know, you you've been an inspiration to me, Dr. Cornell West, and I, I truly, truly thank you, brother, for joining us on this platform today. I, I know that our brothers and sisters in South Africa, in the United States, and around the world who witnessed this live and who will see it later will greatly benefit from uh, your, your wisdom and, you know, your, your penchant for, uh, for speaking truth to power. May Allah bless you and keep you with us for a long, long time to come. Brother, we praying for each other and I'm giving you a, a hug through the technology. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, my brother. May Allah bless you with a great day. <laughs> God bless you, though, man. Thank you so much. Thank you so All much. All right, my brother. brother. All right. Stay strong. Now. How are you too. I'm going to conclude with, you know, our uh, uh, Quranic dua from Surah Al Asr. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wal Asr. Inna al insan alafi kusr. Illa ladina amanu wa amalu salihat. But to wassal bil haq, but to wassal bil sabr. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, by the token of time through the ages, verily humanity is in loss, except those who believe and do good. 
and exhort one another to truth and exhort one another to patiently persevere. Thank you for joining us. Peace be unto you. Assalamu alaikum.